Let's pray as we look at that part of God's word together. Uh, Father, again, we thank you that we can meet here as your people. And we ask that you will be guiding us uh, with your spirit this day to hear these words of Jesus and to trust him all our days. Help me speak only what is true and what is based on the words of your son. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Who is our authority? Who are the authorities that we listen to, that we pay attention to, the ones that actually influence how we live day to day? Uh, something about human existence is that we always talk about who actually authorised you to do whatever it is you may have done. But we've been especially conscious of that these past couple of years with all things COVID going on in our world. Uh, because basically, it doesn't matter what viewpoint you have, everyone is trying to back it up by saying, I have an authority that agrees with me. It doesn't matter if you are someone who is, who is anti-vax or you're a vaccinator, if you're someone who thinks boosting should happen or should not happen, if you think we should be endlessly vaccinating or stopping now, whether you think we should be wearing masks or not wearing masks, whether you think we should have get rid of all of the restrictions that are in place or whether you think we should be cranking up the restrictions. Everyone has an authority that they can say, here's some random scientist who agrees with my view. Here's some random survey that's been done that shows that I'm right. Here are some statistics that I can show you that backs up everything I'm saying. Everyone's claiming they have an authority right now to lean on to judge this. And that's one of the things that actually made the whole thing quite confusing for so much of us, us, us laity when it comes to the realm of of, of science and medicine and, and, and virus responses, there are all these authorities out there telling us one thing or another. Uh, humanity is continually thinking about authority. Sometimes it's actually, we do it in the home in a far more, less important setting. Every household has had the experience where one member of the household is suddenly spotted eating ice cream, to which you then say, who said you were allowed to eat ice cream? Who was the authority? I was mum. Oh, okay then. There, there, is, there, is, there is this sort of level of it, all the way through to the extremes that we've been seeing happening in our world over these past few weeks in particular, where it's been, which authority will anyone listen to? Is the Russian president meant to listen to authorities in Ukraine or in NATO or in the EU or whatever it might be? Everyone's been claiming their own authority, whether or not they do or do not listen to them. And so, this morning, as we uh, continue our series, well, really, it's a new series. It's incredibly imaginative title, by the way. You might remember the previous one was called Journey to Jerusalem. It's now Jesus in Jerusalem. Uh, we're basically, hopefully, the plan is by Easter Sunday, we're going to be looking at the resurrection. So we're going to try and get through this chunk of uh, scripture over these next few weeks until... Uh, that wonderful day of celebration on Easter Sunday. We're going to see Jesus in Jerusalem. We're going to see his authority being questioned. Uh, he's going to have this encounter with the religious leaders who are questioning his authority. And then he's going to tell them a parable, which is really all about challenging their authority. Uh, so we're going to jump right in there and read this uh, encounter that Jesus has uh, with the religious leader were told that one day as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Uh, so what we're meant to imagine is this probably would have been representatives of the Sanhedrin. Uh, if you've never heard of the Sanhedrin before, don't stress too much about that. They're basically the, the religious ruling council in Israel at the time. Uh, and so it sounds like we've got a few different representatives from the ruling council. We're basically seeing Jesus has turned up in Jerusalem with this triumphal entry of crowds cheering for him. He then turns up at the temple and starts flipping over tables, as we spoke about last week. And now he's standing there in the temple courts teaching people. And they're like, who is this guy? What, what, what authority does he have to do that? And especially because the way Jesus taught, we've seen through the gospel that one of the, the shocking things that people have said about Jesus is that he teaches as one with authority. Because usually when someone was teaching, if someone even had sort of my kind of role, it would always be, well, Rabbi this says that, and Rabbi that says that, and therefore that's why I think this. But Jesus would just speak and say, this is the truth. And so they say to him, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to turn up in our temple and start clearing out the money changers and everything else going on here? 
How dare you act as you have been acting? Now, Jesus, I suppose, he would have been a great politician. Because what does he do? He says, I'll answer your question with a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Now they have a conundrum. These members of the Sanhedrin, they discuss to themselves and say, well, if we say John's baptism came from heaven, then Jesus is going to ask us, well, why didn't we believe him? But if we say it's of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. You can see the conundrum that these religious leaders face, can't you? If they say that John was telling the truth, then they should be listening to Jesus. Uh, one of the other great uh, 316s of the Bible, one of the more underrated 316s of the Bible, comes from Luke. Uh, we're told that John the Baptist... Uh, in verse 15, we're told that people were expectantly, uh, waiting expectantly, wondering their hearts if John the Baptist might be the Messiah. And then we're told in 3.16, John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's saying, someone greater than me is coming. He's the Messiah who's coming. That's John's message. And so if they say that John's baptism was inspired by God, then they should be listening to the message of John. But of course, what they really believe is that it was of human origin. But they're afraid because the people liked John. They thought John was great. And so if they go out there and say John was just some random lunatic eating locusts in the desert, then they would be stoned. And so the religious leaders don't actually have the courage of their conviction to say what they believe is truth, that John was a lunatic. And so instead, what are we told? They answer, we don't know where it was from. And so Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. But he kind of does. Because he then tells them a story. It flows straight on to the parable of the tenants. And you've got to imagine that this scene has happened. So, John, so, so the, the religious leaders have tried to challenge Jesus. Jesus rebuts their challenge quite cleverly. And then he tells them a story. And they're listening. And the crowds are around. And the temple court's also listening to this story. So we're going to hear about this the parable of the tenants. Uh, and I'm kind of stealing a, a breakup from uh, one of the commentators, Kent Hughes, that really what we're going to see in the parable of the tenants are these three things. We're going to hear about the kindness of God, the severity of God, and the triumph of God. So Jesus tells this parable. We're told that he says that a man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. Now, if you're the crowds and you're the religious leaders there, you know straight away the, the, the basic points of who Jesus is referring to here. One of the most common uh, sort of analogies of the Old Testament is to describe Israel as a vineyard. Uh, the most famous one of them all comes from Isaiah, uh, from Isaiah chapter 5. And it says this, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad now I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. And then it finishes with, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard the cries of distress. Everyone understood the basic points that Jesus was making in this story. They understood that God is the one who is going to be planting the vineyard. He is the owner of it. And 
the vineyard are the people. It is the nation of Israel. Uh, the farmers, you could probably argue, now there's a little bit of to and fro about trying to argue who every character is, and if you, it's always a danger to over-analyse a parable, but it's probably particularly saying that the farmers aren't just the people of Israel, although it is them, but it's especially those in charge. So he is especially speaking to these members of the Sanhedrin standing right in front of him who just challenged him. And I'm distracted by the word farmer. I'm going to distract myself with it and then keep going. Random Greek for the day. Uh, the word for farmer in Greek is basically the word George. Uh, and George means worker of the land, literally. Anyway, there's a random Greek for the day. So next time you meet someone named George, call them a farmer or a worker of land. Anyway, back to it. The owner plants the vineyard, puts the farmers in charge, goes away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He then sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He then sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. This is the story of the nation of Israel, isn't it? God kept sending prophet after prophet after prophet to tell them to turn back to him, to turn back to him, to turn back to him, including Isaiah, who said those words about the vineyard. And they were rejected and rejected and rejected. You think of people like Elijah, who was forced to flee into the wilderness. Isaiah himself, we don't necessarily know from the scriptures, but there is a, a, a traditional account that he was sawn in two. The prophet uh, Zechariah, not the one who wrote the book, there was another Zechariah in the time of Kings, he was stoned to death, roughly speaking, where Jesus was standing. And then we think of even John the Baptist, the one leading up to Jesus, and he was beheaded. God sent servant after servant after servant to his people, and they did not listen. So then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. Notice what Jesus is saying here, by the way, what he's saying about his own identity. God sent servant after servant after servant. They are the prophets. But now the owner of the vineyard, God, sends his son. Jesus is saying to them, I am the son of God that we have been, you have been waiting for. Surely they will respect him, says the owner of the vineyard. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over and they said, this is the heir. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And so they threw him out of the vineyard. They took him outside and they killed him. Uh, people who try and overanalyze parables, try to understand the logic of this. I'm not sure if there is much logic. Maybe it's like a squatter's rights thing. They think, well, if the heir comes and he gets killed and the, the owner dies, then it'll become theirs. I don't know. No one really understands. The point is, though, they do this horrible thing. They see the son and they kill him. Friends, as we look at this parable, we're meant to see the kindness of God to his people. Because he didn't just leave them, but he kept sending servant after servant after servant to turn them back to him. And then God sent his son to his people. And yet, look what they did. Uh, back in the day, uh, when I was in my first year or two out of school, I used to teach high school scripture. Uh, I could volunteer at the local high school, just a, you know, a few hundred metres down the road from our church, just a local public school. We'd go in there one day a week uh, and teach all, I think, the year sevens and year eights, these scripture lessons. Uh, and one of my favourite lessons that we did with them was this one where we got to uh, get Play-Doh. We brought Play-Doh with us, which already makes it a good lesson, doesn't it? Uh, and so we got Play-Doh, and we basically would, would tell the kids, kids, the youth, what do you want to call them, the year sevens, year eights, make your own creation. Create your own, whether it be a, an animal, a monster, whatever you want to create, create something. Create the best thing you can possibly make, some sort of life form. 
And so they'd spend all this time intricately creating this thing and, and whatever. And then we tell them, now imagine that this thing actually does, is alive, has come to life, but hates you, but rejects you, wants nothing to do with you, wants you to get out of their life and go away. What will you do? And of course, I mean, I was always with the teenage boys in the group and they all had the same reaction. Crush it! <laughs> Destroy this play -Doh. They throw it around, they bash it and whatever else. And he'd say, if you were God, that's what you would have done. But instead, God sent his son. Charles Spurgeon said this of the story. He said, if you reject Jesus, he answers you with tears. If you wound him, he bleeds out cleansing. If you kill him, he dies to redeem. If you bury him, he rises again to resurrection. Jesus is love made manifest. Our God is this incredible God, this God of enduring kindness. But even when his people reject him, he still loves them. He sends his son to die for them. And you have to keep that bit in your mind before you get to the next bit of the parable that really shocks. Because then we hear about the severity of God when people continue to reject him. Because Jesus says, after he tells that story, that they've just killed the son, he says, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to those farmers, those Georges at the vineyard? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Uh, the phrase they use there, it's, it's the only occasion it's used in the Gospels. It's like the most, I am shocked moment. It's this like moment of, what did you just say? That's the kind of look you meant to imagine the crowd happening. They, they have heard the most horrible thing. That God is going to reject not only his leaders, but really his people and give his vineyard Israel to someone else. That suddenly the implication was that suddenly Gentiles would suddenly come under God's blessing. And they say, God forbid. Of course, judgment happened very quickly after this. Because of course, we know what happens. The, 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 the religious leaders who are standing before Jesus, who hear this parable told of them, their response is to kill him a few days later. And that judgment would eventually come. Eventually, the, the temple itself would be destroyed only 30 odd, 40 years later. And suddenly, whilst it was the Jewish followers of Jesus who started the church, it would then become this church that is primarily consisting of Gentiles. God judged in a very, very harsh manner. But it was of people who had continually rejected him. But then we're meant to hear also the triumph of God in this story. Because Jesus then looked directly at the crowds and looked at the religious leaders standing in front of him and asked them, then what is the meaning of what, that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Uh, Jesus basically quotes one passage and alludes to another with these words. Uh, he quotes from Psalm 118, uh, verse 22, which that's what the quote is. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the same psalm that people were quoting the previous day when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, when they were saying, uh, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Psalm 118, verse 26. A couple of verses before that, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Uh, and what Jesus is, is saying here is that, now there's a bit of argument, what does it mean to be the cornerstone? Is it a capstone? Is it like the final stone that gets put on top of a building? Or is it actually this corner one, which is the most important foundation stone in the building? The idea being when you build an ancient building of stones, you need to, to have the, the one in the corner set up right because not only will it, 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 it be carrying a, a great deal of the, the, the weight of the entire building, but you also need to make sure it's aligned up right because if it's not lined up right, then everything else gets wonky as you build it. It is the most important stone. 
And Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of Psalm 118. I am the one that you, the leaders, have rejected. But actually, I am the most important one of all. And then he says, everyone who falls on it will be broken. Anyone who falls will be crushed. And there's a few different things that he's probably alluding to here. But I think that the, the most... The, 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 the most sort of powerful one is probably the story from Daniel. Uh, some of you remember it's a, a sort of story that gets told. Uh, we don't look at Daniel very often except outside of Sunday school, but it's that story of King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he has this dream and he calls in all these wise men and says, uh, tell me what my dream means. And they say, sure, how about you tell us about the dream, King, and then we'll tell you what it means. And he says, no, nah, that's cheating. You've got to tell me what my dream was and then interpret it for me. And of course, no one can do it except for Daniel. Uh, Daniel prays and he has this vision given to him by God. And he suddenly is able to come before the king and say, this is what your dream was and this is what it meant. You might remember it was that dream uh, where uh, King Nebuchadnezzar sees this gigantic uh, statue made of different metals. Uh, and, and, And then suddenly uh, this rock that's behind the statue gets carved up by hands that aren't human hands uh, and, and, and what gets carved what gets created by this rock suddenly strikes down the statue, demolishes the statue and then grows and grows and becomes this huge mountain that fills the whole earth and Daniel basically explains to King Nebuchadnezzar that he's part of the statue he's a kingdom, all the, all the different metals in the statue are various kingdoms but actually he says that In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze and the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. The eternal kingdom of God is this rock carved out that crushes all the other kingdoms of the world and sets up this kingdom that will rule over the entire world and rule forever. And Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And he is the one that you need to be in the right relationship with. You are either someone who will conquer with him in his kingdom or you will be crushed by him. They are words for us all to hear. They are words that are actually quite poignant right now. Daniel 2 and these words of Jesus are actually a message for rulers like the Russian president. They are a message to say, sure, you might have this, this whatever you want to call what he's doing right now, this special military operation to create a larger empire, whatever you want to call this expanding of boundaries. But that kingdom will not last. It will be destroyed and one day he will have to face up to King Jesus who does have the eternal kingdom. And if he is not submitted to his lordship, then that is his fate. Verse 18. And justice will prevail. Friends, as we, as we wrap this up, it, it's a bit easy to, to, to hear a story like this and feel a bit like this has nothing for us. Because really, Jesus is talking to the people standing directly in front of him in this story. They are the, the, the ones that he is particularly preaching to. They are the ones that he's particularly warning. The religious leaders standing in front of him and the crowds that are there. Do not reject the one God has sent or you will be crushed. And so we think, well, given that's already already happened, so what for us? And yet I want to suggest that this is one of those parts in the Bible where you read it and you realise, how much more so does this apply to us? Because not only do we have the prophets that God sent continually warning and warning and warning us to turn to God, but we also have the apostles of the Son who speak the message of the Son, who speak of his death for us and for our salvation, who speak of his resurrection and his conquering the grave, who speak of his ascension back to the Father, who speak of the fact that he will return as the king of the everlasting eternal kingdom. And so if we are not submitting to the Son, 
If we are not submitting to his authority in our lives, then how much more so do we realise we must face the prospect of being crushed by the king when he does return? And so we have to face that question. Who is our authority? Who is Lord of our lives? Now we say, sure, I'm here at church. Surely I'm saying it's Jesus. Well, yeah, the Sanhedrin were the religious leaders of Israel. If anyone could claim I should be right with God by the fact that I'm dwelling in a certain location, it was them. But they had not actually submitted to the lordship of the son that God had sent. And so the question for us is, have we submitted to his lordship? Is he the authority of our life? Is he the one that we trust in? If he is, then that is great, then we will conquer with him. But if he is not, then we must heed that warning. Otherwise, we will be, to use the language of Jesus, crushed. Now, I'm assuming for most of us, we have done that. But then there is this daily submission as well. You see, is Jesus actually the authority of every area of our life? It's easy for us to say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yes, he is my king. But really, it only impacts the fact that we turn up on a Sunday. And when it comes to all the decisions we make day in, day out throughout the week, Jesus seems to have very little impact. But actually, a whole heap of other authorities because we live in a world of authorities everywhere, are the ones we listen to. Maybe it's the papers we read. And so whether it's the Chronicle or the Advocate or the Mercury, if you want to read one of the big mainland papers, maybe it's something like the Australian, the Guardian, whatever it might be, and you realise actually the one who most impacts you is your favourite journalist and listening to what they say about all world events and all national events and all local events that are going on. And that's the one that I follow. We are, of course, in an election year, which means that we become far more tribal about those things. And so for those who, 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 who love the, the, the government, then we'll say, whatever the government says is right, that's what I believe on all issues. Or those who don't like the government say, whatever the opposition says is right, and I will follow them and vote because of that. Or I will like what the, what the minor parties say, and I will listen to everything they say and believe everything they say to be true. Sometimes it's people you listen to on the radio. It's your favourite talkback host who always seems to be right and has the ability to hang up on callers if they get challenged about being wrong. Or maybe it's your favourite podcaster who is continually pushing buttons. You might have a more Christian way of viewing it and you say, well, it's actually what I hear at church. It's, well, Joel said this, then that must be right. Or more likely, it's my favourite preacher I listen to from wherever and they must be right. Or whatever it might be. But friends, we must be continually assessing the decisions we make in life and the way we view the world, not through these random other authorities, no matter how convincing they may be, but through the words of the Lord Jesus. For he is the king of the everlasting kingdom. And so we must be thinking through all these issues that are going on and thinking, what would Jesus want me to do? Whether it be what he has said in the Gospels, but of course the whole thing are the words of Christ, are the words of our God. And so, friends, the challenge today is, are you listening to the King of the everlasting kingdom? And are you letting him be the ultimate authority in how you live? Let's pray to the King of all kings. Lord Jesus, you are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords. And so we come before you and acknowledge that because you are who you are, then we must submit to you. Help us submit to you in our whole life. Help us see the world through your eyes and through your words and seek to honour you in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Now... I'm pretty sure I'm also on prayer this week. So we're going to continue praying. We will pray for what is...